Thanks, Enza Maria. Um, so what I want to do today is to, is to put the cerebellum sort of in context. Um, uh, so here we have disorders, intellectual disability. Uh, there is autism, um, epilepsy, infantile spasms, a genesis of the corpus callosum, and then the cerebellar disorders, Dandy Walker, that are, have been used as final diagnoses for decades and decades and decades. And what the new genetics is showing us is that's so often not true. Um, it's not true for Dandy Walker malformation, as I will show you. And guess what? It's not true for the others either. Now, high, mild mental retardation and high-functioning autism may be different. I don't know. But when you have severe autism with mental retardation, epilepsy, et cetera, that's never your final diagnosis. Um, but Dandy Walker malformation and some of these other cerebellar abnormalities um, are used as a final diagnosis. Let's see what you think when I get through all of this. So just before I did this, I transferred this from a Mac to this PC system, and there's some images that are just not going to do well, and I'm going to apologize ahead of time. It's not my fault. And here's one of them. All right, so the cerebellum is highly conserved structure and function over evolution. There are only nine principal neuronal types, and there's a very stereotyped uh, structure, uh, layers and circuitry. Uh, what most people don't know is that in both mouse and human, the, uh, the cerebellum, you know, the tiny cerebellum contains more than 80% of the neurons in your entire brain. Uh, most of those being granule cells, and all of those come from a teeny tiny little spot called the, uh, the granule cells, at least. Uh, there you are, know, sitting uh, like a cauliflower beneath the, the, the brain. Uh, where is my little show? Well, I'll get back to that uh, rhombic lip in a minute. Um, so there have been a number of different malformations of the cerebellum described, some of them that have been really very clear-cut and consistent, but rare, except for the Joubert-associated one. Um, and I list them up at the top. But the ones that you hear about most are the ones that I call cerebellar hypoplasia patterns that we have used as diagnoses. And my diagnostic criteria have shifted over the years. Um, and I'm finally getting to I, I, the point where I'm wondering and asking the question of whether it really matters. Are these really different? And a question too often asked, and quite similar to the corpus callosum question asked a minute ago. All right, so I and some buddies um, uh, uh, developed a very detailed, exhaustive, boring classification of brain stem and cerebellar malformations a couple years ago. We'll update that by and by. It is available. Um, what I want to show you here is that um, the genetics is kind of different here. So with the well-defined malformations, except for rhombencephalosynapsis or fusion of the right-left cerebellar hemispheres with a missing vermis in the middle, that has frustrated exome and genome uh, efforts, but the other four have large numbers of genes and pathways associated of these specific malformations, cobblestone, Walker-Warburg syndrome, for example, Joubert, uh, the tubulinopathies, but these other cerebellar patterns have, uh, have been frustrating to address, um, and we have re relatively few, in quotes, cerebellar genes, and I think I'm beginning to understand why. So here is the mouse cerebellar vermis, uh, I'm sorry, cerebellar developmentally, and a little tiny part of it of a couple of uh, microns and then maybe a millimeter later on, right here, generates 80% of the nerve cells in the mouse brain. The same thing is true in the human, a very tiny area. So the human cerebellum is very different uh, developmentally from the rest of the brain, particularly the cerebral cortex your cerebral cortex starts developing at about six weeks or so and is really charging between about nine and 14 weeks and then does continue to develop. The cerebellum is mostly developing in the late second trimester, the third trimester, and the first full year or so after birth. That's a big, big difference. And that little tiny structure, the rhombic lip, uh, persists for quite a while, and you can see it right there at the bottom in that tiny little structure hanging off the cerebellum uh, that looks like it accounts for one one hundredth of the cerebellum creates 80% of the neurons in your brain. Pretty remarkable. And you can see the dramatic changes even between 23 weeks gestation 
and 26 weeks gestation and 37. Um, dramatic changes. So here, the cerebellar vermis, at least, has a very specific structure, the anterior vermis. Uh, the posterior is everything else, but I divide it into the back part, the decli, foliar, and, tulum, uh, and tuber, and the bottom part, the, uh, the uvula and pyramus. And it is the uvula and pyramus that are the most frequently involved in the human cerebellum, and that is very, very different from the mouse. And my colleague, Dr. Kathy Millen in Seattle, um, and Parthiv Haldapur, a postdoc working with her, have recently shown that the rhombic lip goes away in the mouse, but it doesn't go away in the human. The human and mouse cerebellar development are dramatically different, and this probably explains a great deal of why we don't understand human cerebellar malformations. Uh, so all these cerebellar malformations were described about a century or so ago, and maybe 50 to 100 years ago, and the ideas about how they developed used science of the time, which, as you now well know, is mostly a lot of baloney. And, uh, and, so, and here, um, in a, even in the 1970s, this is how they were diagnosing Dandy Walker malformation. This is pre-CT scan. Um, goodness, so we have come a long way. Um, all right, so um, I'm, I'm dissing on all of these different cerebellar malformations and whether there's a Blake's pouch cyst and there's a vermis hypoplasia and all this and that and Dandy Walker. So one of my questions, is there really a, any pattern recognition form of a cerebellar hypoplasia? Is Dandy Walker different than these other ones? And the answer, I think that it, it is. And so we were convinced after we replicated um, the paper from uh, Silvia Bernardo and others from La Sapienza in Rome, and here you can show the key bit. So the key bit, if you look down here, well, up here, every cerebellar folia has lobules on both sides, every single one. But if you look down here, it only has it on one side. Um, so they thought that might be a really key sign, and we absolutely agree. So this is a big deal. So here are, um, at the bottom, I have these specific patterns that I'm not going to talk about too much. Um, and here, I'm sorry, specific syndromes, malformations, and here are the patterns that I am going to talk about a fair amount. You see, even on an NMRI scan, you can see that unpaired lobule right there, and we see that in about 80% or 85% of our dandy walkers, and I think the group in Rome is close to that. Uh, here's one that doesn't have that tail, so it does happen where you still get the small vermis with the uprotated vermis, so the fourth ventricle you know, flows out into a big posterior fossa and an enlarged posterior fossa. So uh, one of the questions that we're asking is, is that different? Okay? And the other question I'm just prepping you for, is it all genetic? And the answer of course, is, of course, no. All right, so let's go beyond that. So here is just, I wanted to show you that this dandy walker with the tail or the unpaired final lobule is not rare. We got a lot of them. It's 80% of our dandy walkers, so I probably got 30 or 40 of them. And you can see it here. Let's see if I can find one that's particularly easy here. This is a really easy one to see right there. Um, some of them, you know, at the res here's another nice, really easy one to see. It can be a little tricky to see. There's that one, but they all have got it. Um, and the resolution is not as great as you'd like it, but you can see it. Um, so then there's all these other cerebellar malformations, the megacisterna magna, where the posterior fossa is big, but the cerebellar vermis is normal. Then some of you may have seen a big posterior fossa, a cerebellum that's in just the right position, but it's small. There is no classification for that. So you, I see it frequently, but this is one of the little problems. There's something called the Blake's pouch cyst, where the fourth ventricle is supposed to balloon out and that membrane, which is supposed to dissolve, doesn't dissolve, so you've got a cyst compressing the lower part of the vermis. And I suppose that exists. Um, is it really different? Anyway, so what we have done is to try to look at si a copy number variants and uh, you know, sequencing variants, uh, you know, genetic mutations. MFM stands for maternal fetal medicine, prenatal problems, and other I'm going to skip. The paper we did on copy number variants uh, was shown in the last, was it? No, it wasn't. We, uh, it was, yes, it was. It was shown for agenesis in the last talk. We did copy number variants in like 150 patients with cerebellar hypoplasia, and we didn't find squat. We had excluded the two dandy walker loci of 3Q22, ZIC1, ZIC4, and, and 6P25.3, FOXC1. 
Um, but other than that, it's really rare. Yes, we found a couple inverted dupe dells of 8P. All right, so where are we? All right, so the first um, attack on this was, was a long time ago where we identified Dandy Walker in the literature with deletions of 3Q22 to 23, and after a struggle of a couple of years with uh, older technology, we identified a deletion of the, of the uh, tandem genes ZIK1 and ZIK4. All right, and even here, you can see that that's a real Dandy Walker, but these, they're not. They're cerebellar hypoplasias. All right, and here, in, uh, a couple of years later, we identified deletions of 6P25.3, the last band on 6P, um, and uh, with a lot of large deletions, uh, identified FOXC1 as the most likely the primary causative gene, and here's a good example of a real Dandy Walker with FOXC1. They don't all have real Dandy Walker. All right, so what did we do? Um, uh, we did whole exome sequencing uh, of children with, I, I, I excluded uh, the Joubert syndrome when I recognized it. I excluded pontocerebellar hypoplasia, a prenatal onset degenerative disorder of the cerebellum when I recognized it. I excluded rhombencephalosynapsis and took Dandy Walker and just the core cerebellar hypoplasia uh, disorders and separated them, because I, I, I didn't have enough. We would have needed 500 to separate it into, you know, megasister and magda and Blake's pouch cyst. So I just said Dandy Walker or something else. We had 100 of them, um, and most of them were trios or a couple quads. So we had trios or quads on uh, 86 out of the 100, and then a couple duos and singletons. We solved a lot of them, far higher than I was really expecting to solve. Um, we are uh, for sure solved, I think, what is it, 33 genes in 36 or 42 patients. 42 if you add a couple of novel, likely pathogenic genes. Uh, one of the other things I did was look at the developmental level. If you go to the old Dandy Walker literature from neurosurgeons back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and neurosurgeons generally know what Dandy Walker is, with, uh, particularly with the hydrocephalus, uh, they divided into two groups, um, a lot with normal intelligence, almost 45%, and a lot with severe handicap, and remarkably, very few in between. So I decided to do the same thing. Out of the 100, I think I've talked to about 70 mothers to make sure I had the updated data. You'll see why in a couple of minutes. Uh, does it make a difference? All right, so here are the genes that we found. A couple of novel ones that are not quite, I think, are pathogenic, but obviously they need a little bit of work. Uh, you should recognize a lot of the genes here, but forget the top part. Here we go, down at the bottom. We had three genes that are well-known, in quotes, autism genes, uh, four that are well-known early childhood epilepsy genes, or early life epilepsy, uh, four different X-linked uh, intellectual disability genes, and then we missed a couple atypical tubulinopathies and Joubert syndromes, and there's two rasopathies. What are they doing there? Interesting question. So CASC, I uh, uh, worked with uh, uh, Kirsten Kutscher from uh, Hamburg some years back to identify CASC as a um, intellectual, X-linked intellectual disability gene with consistent cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, when you eventually find a boy with a bad mutation, they have really bad cerebellar hypoplasia that's surrounded by the, uh, the blue box in the lower right-hand corner here. Um, the cerebellar hypoplasia differs in severity, but it's never mild. It's moderate to severe, and in boys, it's super severe. Uh, here's a new one, BCL11A. Um, we had two patients come up out of our 100 with this, surprisingly, and you can see the relatively subtle cerebellar hypoplasia, but it's real uh, here. They often have ventricular megaly as well. Um, interestingly, like a lot of the syndromes here, you don't sit down in clinic and recognize, by and large, that a child has a BCL11A syndrome. It's just not that specific. Many of them, like the young man on the left, left have a normal facial appearance. On the right, he's really obviously very syndromic. Um, there are other papers. So one of the things I did in this cohort is say, okay, I've identified a cerebellar hypoplasia gene. Is this just random or chance? So what I did, um, was, was go back to either my database or the literature and find other patients with mutations of that same gene and ask Dr. Smith to send me the brain scan. And in this case, Dr. David Dement from uh, Ottawa did send me the brain scan, and you can see it's here really pretty striking cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, 
soon after we identified that, then other people did too, and there's a dysmorphic features, and what I want to show you is this, a paper describing, in quote, cerebellar abnormalities with BCL11A, so clearly this is a pretty consistent feature. Here's another example, a pretty well-known gene called FOXP1, and there has been papers now talking about the cerebellum. Um, so I've had for many years some deletions of this region, uh, as we thought it might be another Dandy Walker locus, difficult, it turned out to be a difficult uh, region of the genome to work with, so I've, but I've got a bundle of patients with the deletions, uh, and here they are, and note that one of them has a classic great big old Dandy Walker malformation, the real deal, the others are really borderline. And oh yeah, this is a theme I'm going to give you. How many of you would have, would, have, uh, would have bought it if I sold you that Dandy Walker malformation and Chiari malformation are part of the same developmental spectrum? Well, guess what? Um, and we don't see that in every one of them, but you're going to see that several times today. Here are the introgenic mutations of FOXP1, uh, and you can see it's, uh, um, it's consistent. Most of them have a cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, these the, the three images you see here get classified differently. The one on the left is called a, gets called a megacisterna magna. This one obviously is, is a diffuse cerebellar hypoplasia, and this one is also a megacisterna magna, uh, as if it, you know, it's, again, I'm not so clear that it makes a difference. All right, so here's another good example. This is a gene called PUS3. We found a child from Poland I've not been able to, to refine, unfortunately, a clear-cut Dandy Walker malformation. Fortunately, there was one report in the literature of a family with three brothers from uh, Fosan al Karaya in uh, Saudi Arabia, and with one email, uh, good old uh, Dr. al Karaya sent me all three CDs, and here they are, brothers one and three, the cerebellum looks okay, but brother two, sure enough, there's a megacisterna magna with a mild in, uh, hypoplasia of the inferior vermis here. So, in this confirmatory cohort, um, with a known mutation of the same gene, the cerebellar phenotype looks real. All right, here's another good cookie. This is AUTS2. That, that means it's this autism gene 2. So what's the phenotype? Of course, it's autism. So for all of you geneticists, and I love talking geneticists because sometimes things, things are easier. So you've got a kid with Rubin sign Tabi, and what's one of the great signs? Right, the great sign is big smile and their eyes close. Right? I mean, you know, what other syndrome has that? Well, uh, guess what? This syndrome does, and it turns out that AUTS2 binds to EP300, which is the rubenstein tb 2 gene, although other facial features, while very dysmorphic, are not, um, not rubenstein tb uh, The others are, most of the reports are deletions of this gene, so entire deletions of this gene actually are less severe than these missense mutations, and that's a theme we're seeing a lot in genetics lately. So here is his brain scan. Yes, his corpus closed and is too short, and it's a little bit thin. This is one of the things that led me to that comment a few minutes ago. And there's a cerebellum that's really very small. Um, so there have been a lot of papers out there on this, mostly the uh, deletions. Um, and, but, so, but I found a couple. Here's another child who's sort of dysmorphic. And I found another very dysmorphic child um, in Ferrara, uh, Italy, when I was lecturing earlier in the week. So here are some of the scans, and a number of these cerebella are normal. Here's our boy, but here's a child who happened to have, unluckily, you have to get two diseases. He had Lay's disease, the mitochondrial encephalomyopathy, and died from that, but Lay's does not have corpus closed cerebellar hypoplasia, and at birth, this boy had partial, severe partial agenesis of the corpus closum and a small cerebellum. Um, so, and it does happen. So there's some variability, but there's something going on with the missense mutations which are right in exon 9 where the second transcriptional start type uh, occurs. So something's complicated about this gene. All right, let's go and look at the big picture here. Uh, so I classified 45 as real deal Dandy Walker malformation and 55 as cerebellar hypoplasia. Function, let's look at function. So, if you have done prenatal work, you know that these prenatal studies uh, report that, boy, Dandy Walker malformation, yeah, you need to worry about that outcome, but this baby's only got the Dandy Walker variant, so the outcome's going to be better. Guess what? That's not at all what I see, and the p-value is highly significant. I found low function with, with other cerebellar malformations vastly more frequently than Dandy Walker. 
Now, what do I think is going on here? Um, so when you look through the prenatal literature, there is a growth profile in some fetuses where the cerebellum is small and then starts to catch up. Now, those kids get born, and they're never coming to me to see as part of a developmental disorder research project. And so it's not like they are completely wrong, and my data is completely right, but saying that vermis hypoplasia is better than Dandy Walker, oh, you need to be careful about that. That's not what I'm seeing. And so we need to be able to separate out this variant growth profile in, in fetal life of the cerebellum from true cerebellar hypoplasias, and that's going to be difficult, but it has to be done, and maybe genetics needs to help us. Um, but the, the low function, high function, that's a big deal. That's a big story, and that's going to significantly change. It should significantly change what you are saying to the families that you are seeing. Our solve rate, um, look at that, 53% for miscellaneous cerebellar hypoplasias and only 29% for Dandy Walker malformation. And yeah, that's a pretty significant p-value as well. Um, twins, I'll get to twins after a little bit, but we had 12 of them equally divided um, between the Dandy Walker and the non-Dandy Walker. How many should we have had? Well, the answer is, uh, I think it's in the next slide. Oop, no, it's coming, it's coming. Um, so one of the things I did was, uh, was to try to look a little harder at this, this idea about the unpaired lobular tail that came from the group at Sapiens in Rome. And so what I did, I redid the data by throwing out any dandy walker if it didn't have a tail. I moved it up to the miscellaneous cerebellar hypoplasia group. Our numbers fell a little bit because I had a few CT scans. Uh, there are some neurosurgeons who still don't do an MRI scan. Who knows why? Um, and so we, our numbers are a little bit lower, but they actually got more significant, right? both, the, both in the high versus low function and, the, and in the solved rate. All right, MFM. All right, so there's the genetics. And so the yield has gone from a few percent with two genes, or actually three genes if you count the link ZIC1, ZIC4, to a solve rate of about 40% or so. And this is not that different than what you see in intellectual disability and, and, and autism, or at least autism with intellectual disability, because as you all know, the genetic solve rate for high-functioning autism is about zip for zip. But anyway, so this is a big change, a big change, and many of the genes you already know. All right, what's the rest of the story? So in all of these big genetic uh, studies of developmental brain disorders, one of the things that geneticists almost never do, particularly if you are not a physician, is go back and really look at those kids who were negative. And all these, you know, studies saying, oh boy, we're going to look at RNA sequencing, we're going to look at, um, um, at epigenetics, we're going to look at non-coding RNAs and all of this. Well, and all that is fine, and we're going to find bits and pieces of that. Um, but Where's the, where's the real story there? You know, how many of these are not genetic at all? And this is not just true for cerebellar malformations. And I'm going to show you the, the you know, cold, hard data for the cerebellum, but the same thing is true. When you have a cerebellar problem, a number of our patients, quite a few of them, have autism. Genetic, and in the genetic group, and the group I'm about to show you next. All right, so here's a paper from, I think this was when uh, Dr. Olympiopoulos was in Boston and where there was some fetal hemorrhage in the late second trimester, and it clearly ended up with a Frank Dandy Walker malformation, uh, way up there. The resolution wasn't great, uh, but there's another more recent paper from, I think, Genoa, and oh my god, we're having one of our little problems. Ouch. Well, you can see enough. So there were scans of this baby, and there was evidence of a prenatal hemorrhage that you cannot see here because of this PC problem, and I apologize, but you can see the cerebellar vermis. So here it's small at 27 and 31 weeks, it's small at five days post-birth, and at a year, now it looks like a Dandy Walker malformation. Hmm. So, the, you know, the more things um, um, change, the more they... They stay the same here. Are these really different disorders? All right, so here is another bit. Um, all right, cerebellar hemorrhage, hypoplasia, and prematurity. So it's long been known that premature children may have problems with their cerebellum that are a little bit small, often associated with thin white matter. And it's the thin white matter that is thought to cause the poor developmental outcomes. 
And here is an example of a child that was extremely premature. When I was your age, for the youngest of you, the, the youngest survivor of premature was about 28 weeks now. Now it's down to 22, and the 22 to 27 weeks are called extremely low gestational age newborns, or LGANs. And out of our group, we had four of them, um, a couple twins and a couple of others. All right, so here then is extreme prematurity, um, and it's the incidence, not surprisingly, is much more frequent. You can see it at the bottom right, uh, just over 10% of extreme uh, of LGAN children had significant cerebellar lesions on MRI scan. So that's not trivial. All right, so 12 twins. How did we come up with 12 twins instead of three? Because the number is this. So the birth rate for twins um, has raised because of uh, artificial reproductive technologies from about two and a half or so up to 33.4 per 1,000 or 3.3. So how did our expected three to four twins turn into 12 twins? And that is statistically significant. Well, here's one of the probable reasons. So when you have twin-twin transfusion syndrome, uh, or IUGR, which is probably related to a more subtle twin-twin transfusion syndrome, there's a relatively high risk for uh, cerebellar hyperplasia, which is called Dandy Walker malformation from an ultrasound, when, of course, what that means is there's a cerebellar problem. We don't know what it is. Um, but this was a um, paper where they saw a, what they called Dandy Walker syndrome in 10 of 660 children of 1.5%. Um, so this is not trivial. And so there's a clear prior publications showing an association between cerebellar hyperplasia and twinning, and we've got 12 of them out of 100. All right, so here I want to sort of run all this in. So uh, one of the things that many of you know me, I do, in addition to all my genetics, uh, I am a groupie on MRI scans and pour over them at length. And I'm going to have you do that for a minute now here. So here is a discordant twin. What do we know about discordant twins that are not genetic? One, the birth defect cleft brain or schizencephaly has been well known to be, occur in twins and with young mothers, other non-genetic risk factors. Right? And some cerebellar hyperplasias I just showed you. Let's see what's in the rest of the story here. So look carefully at this, what, that the little lines. So there's heterotopia here. Actually, let me go back and show you the heterotopia. They're big, they're gray nodules. Heterotopia are not associated, reported as a, as a non-genetic feature or a vascular perfusion defect in the literature. They are not. Um, Dr. Garini and I have been struggling to find uh, uh, any positive exome results in our posterior predominant heterotopia, interestingly. And now look carefully. Between the, cere between the heterotopia and the cerebral cortex, see those little lines? A little column of gray cells that I've seen in four or five different discordant twins, including a new one from Utrecht yesterday. Uh, now you go on, and then here's your cerebellum. And what you can see here is, I mean, this isn't small. It's like a stroke. A piece of the cerebellum got eaten out. So this is a sort of pattern that you can see that is convincingly non-genetic. So there's a lot of non-genetic etiologies. And when I added all that up together, I thought there were 21 children that had convincing evidence of non-genetic causation. At the start of the project, I included them because I didn't want to make that assumption. But now, um, most of them were negative. Actually, we did have one or two real genetic disorders, and those kids look like a genetic disorder. But all the rest of them appear to have all of these non-genetic features. So that's a high, high percentage. And I wonder whether we have similarly high percentage, or maybe not quite that high, in some of these other intellectual disability, epilepsy, and uh, autism uh, cohorts. All right, so there's one other kind of neat thing. So what I've told you here is that there's a whole lot going on genetically, far more than we saw before, that the cerebellum is occasionally a high-frequency feature of a phenotype. And what I didn't you know, dwell on in some of these other genes is that it's an intermediate to low-frequency feature of a number of these syndromes as well. Then I went on and talked about underlying problems in the late second and third trimester. Those can be hemorrhage into the cerebellum or posterior fossa and you know, vascular perfusion failure. Um, so if you can have vascular perfusion failure 
causing these developmental defects as part of the twin situation. Can you have it from some other cause? And so here at the bottom row are four genes on our little list that are all expressed at very high levels in developing vasculature. So the first two rasopathy genes, of those first two, BRAF, which is a CFC gene, is also a head, neck, arteriovenous malformation gene, and it's been associated with several other vascular malformations as well. So there is no question that that is a, has big time expression in developing vasculature. I'm guessing that the PPP1CB gene, that is the Noonan syndrome with loose onigan hair 2 gene, although we know less about that gene. And then I'll show you the others. So, uh, how are we doing for time, uh, Enza, Maria? Oh, we're good. We're fine. Okay. All right. So, um, BRAF. So, here's BRAF. I didn't, I promise to, that there was this um, um, relationship between Dandy Walker or another cerebellar hypoplasias and Chiari malformation. You know, one where there's too much space in the posterior fossa, you know, it's too big. And then with Chiari, it's too small. You know, go figure. So I first sort of got after this when I did a paper on uh, copy number variants of 17P, distal to the lysencephaly gene, when duplications end up having mild cerebellar hypoplasia and the deletions that don't have lysencephaly have Chiari malformation consistently. So there is a type countertype. Um, for example, with, with deletions and dupes of the Soto syndrome locus, when you've got a deletion, you get big head size. When you've got a duplication of the Soto's gene, you get small head size. And there's quite a few different uh, copy number variants like that. Now, why with mutations of the same gene do you start occasionally getting both? Um, either one, it's stochastic and we don't know, or B, it's loss of function versus gain of function. So there's a lot of work to do, but there's a number of these genes, um, at least five of them in this cohort of this set of genes that are associated with both Dandy Walker or a severe cerebellar hypoplasia and Chiari malformation, obviously in different patients. And here, this is a, pub a published report of, uh, of BRAF. Okay, so BRAF is one. Here's PPP1CB. This is another one of these P thing, PC things. Sorry about that. But here is your Chiari malformation in one of four. This is a paper from Dr. organized by Dr. Karen Grip. And then here's our patient who is the only high-functioning true Dandy Walker in our cohort, our young woman with Noonan syndrome with Lusanigan hair, who, who's going to college in the Bay Area. All right, so that's two. I'm guessing it's expressed in developmental vessels. Here's another one. So this one is supposed to be the, a, a Soto syndrome-like gene with overgrowth and retardation and not very dysmorphic. And sure enough, that's exactly what we see in the young man in the upper left here. And then Dr. Ian Glass sent me one of his patients with a de novo variant he didn't uh, really understand. And here is the first um, uh, images, pictures, of a child with mutations of de novo change, a variant in set D2 who is very dysmorphic. But again, this matches what we are seeing across a host of genes. And the brain scans are there. So the more normal boy is up in the top with a clear dandy walker. The young girl has a vermis hypoplasia with a megasister and a magna, probably on the same spectrum here. So clearly, this, for me, validates that we have an underlying abnormality. We actually had two set D2 mutations in our cohort. Here's the most interesting of them all. So when you have a loss of function of PDG, FRB, you get Farr's disease, familial calcification of the basal ganglia with behavioral problems and this and that. Those are loss of functions, forget about it. When you have gain of function missense mutations, the most frequent phenotype is infantile myofibromatosis. And when I'm talking to a group of neurologists, of course, they just blank stare. So I'm hoping many of you know what that is. Those are um, non-cancerous, you know, multiple nodules or lesions with an unusual pathology. Here's one example of one of them in the cerebellum, but the child actually has a cerebellum, okay? So what happened is I got sent from, um, I think, Greenwood, a genetic center, a child with a really bad Dandy Walker malformation who also happened to have infantile myofibromatosis. And of course, I'm saying, well, you know, boy, that's a lemon and a grape. The child's got two different disorders. Wow, that's uh, interesting, very unlucky. Um, and there you have it. Uh, but 
as the project worked on, uh, you, know, you know, Kim and I started working through gene after gene after gene, and finally the, the time for this damn gene came up. And so I went, you know, looking through the literature, there's, it's hard to find infantile myofibromatosis patients, but there was a paper on another missense gain of function uh, uh, disorder called Pentinen syndrome. And Dr. Les Biesecker from the NIH had recently identified a specific single mutation of PDGFRB. And you look through the paper, they talk about, oh, yeah, there's a little posterior fossa cyst. Guess what? The, uh, this is the original Finnish patient, refound, and a little boy from Seattle, seen at Seattle Children's, so I was able to grab his scan. Here you do. So here is the, uh, our proband from South Carolina with infantile myofibromatosis. Here is a clear megacisterna magna. I think the vermis is a little bit small. A very obvious small vermis, again with a megacisterna magna. Bam. So we have a recurrent cerebellar phenotype with gain of function mutations of PDGFRB. I no longer think it's a grape and tomato. It's maybe it's a, I don't know, a, a red grape and a green, but they're, they're grapes. Um, and there you have it. Now, the important thing conceptually here is that the PDGFRG, PDGFRB gene is not expressed in the cerebellum, period. It may be expressed at very low levels in the deep cerebellar nuclei, but when you look at all these expression studies from the Allen Brain Institute and whatnot, what they do is they take a chunk of cerebellum and they you know, do RNA sequencing. And when you take a big chunk of cerebellum, what does it have in it? Blood vessels. And the expression in the cerebellum is very low. You go to blood vessel derived RNA seq experiments and it's very, very high. So it's potentially a new paradigm. All right, so finishing this up, what do we have? Um, are cerebellar mal malformations genetic? Sure they are. So surprisingly, at first, Dandy Walker malformation appears to be much less genetic than all of these other cerebellar malformations, which I'm really struggling to think are all that separate, at least biologically, in um, terms of their pathway. Why? Well, one of the potentially you know, clear reasons here is, is non-genetic factors, prenatal bleeds, prematurity, vascular perfusion problems that may seem to be a cause of the real deal Dandy Walker malformation. So both clear non-genetic and genetic causes can do this. One of the things that you may see when you see a Dandy Walker child, some of them, the cerebellar hemispheres are just perfect as could be, but in a lot of others, they're small and often asymmetric. Cerebellar asymmetry has been clearly reported as a cause of non-genetic cerebellar hypoplasia due to bleeds in the cerebellum or posterior fossa in the late second or early third trimester. So as you start pulling all of this data together, prenatal data, postnatal data, genetic data, for the first time in my life on this, it's just, I, you know, the, there's some light at the end of the tunnel. I think I can start to see what these cerebellar malformations really are. And there I am standing, uh, at least the top half of me is standing on Mount Rainier, our local vo volcano, and I wish you could see the rest of the picture. It's beautiful. So I'm going to stop there, but I think the, the message here is um, this changes for me the entire landscape, not just the genetic landscape, but the landscape of what cerebellar, especially common cerebellar malformations are. And this has lessons that you, we should all be applying to all of these other developmental brain disorders. When you are doing a study of intellectual disability or autism or early life epilepsy or a genesis of the corpus callosum, although that's more genetic, um, by gum, you need to look hard at the phenotype because there are some of them that are clearly not genetic and, and it is our responsibility or the researcher's responsibility to start trying to figure that out. Bam. I'll say thank you.